Welcome to Cyber Threat Intel, your go-to source for the latest updates, news, and insights on cyber threats. Our goal is to arm you with the knowledge to protect yourself in the digital age, whether you're a cybersecurity professional or just curious about the threats lurking in the digital shadows. Make sure to subscribe now on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to join us on the front lines of cybersecurity, because in the world of cyber threats, knowledge is power. Hey, 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 welcome, welcome. This is Cyber Threat Intel. I'm your host, John Good. This is episode number 17. It is Monday, April 15th, 2024. So it's tax day if you live in the United States. Make sure you have done your taxes and hopefully you've taken care of all that and you didn't wait till the last minute. But I know that a lot of people do. So that is one of the things that you just have to do, unfortunately or fortunately, right? Good things and bad things. But uh, make sure you take care of that if you're in the United States. If you're not, uh, I'm not sure if it's your tax day or not. So, but welcome either way. 
If this is the first time that you're joining, typically what we do on these streams is we hop on here, we give people a few minutes to join and tune into the stream because we're doing this live. And then, uh, so grab a drink, grab a snack, anything that you need to get through the show. And then once we go through some of the uh, show notes, then we'll hop into the articles. It's a good way to kick off and just uh, let people kind of roll in as they're able to, right? So depending on where you're finding the show, where you're listening to it, where you're watching it, we're available on all kinds of different platforms. Uh, most commonly, we are on YouTube. So that is kind of our home base on the John Good Cyber YouTube channel. So you can check that out. And that's where we do the live streams. That's where the content for the show is uh, posted always. We're also doing this episode on LinkedIn. So on the John Good Cyber LinkedIn profile page. So my personal profile page. John Good Cyber Twitter channel, as well as the John Good Cyber uh, page on Facebook. So you can also find the live stream and the on-demand replay of the video there as well. If you prefer a podcast format, because some people like listening to it that way, we're also available on there. So you can go search on your favorite platform, Spotify, iTunes, whatever it is, right? We're on a whole bunch of them. But you can find us just by searching for Cyber Threat Intel, and we should come right up. Or you can go to cyberthreatintel.com. Again, cyberthreatintel.com. You can find everything there for the platforms. Also, if you go to the website, you can also find the article feed. So every article that we cover in the episodes, as well as other articles that we don't necessarily have time for, they're all put on, on that feed. So you can find highlights and notes and just a whole bunch of information that's relevant to you, right? So really useful definitely recommend taking advantage of that. Also, if you have professional certifications, CISSP, Security Plus, whatever, right? There's a whole bunch of those as well. A lot of those require continuing education credits, CPEs, CEUs, whatever they call them, right? You have to watch webinars, go to trainings, things like that. You can claim every one of these shows for a half a CPE. So if you do that for the entire year, four times a week, right? For the shows, you're going to have your credits covered for free really quickly. So just make sure you take advantage of that. Don't wait to the end. It is a huge pain if you wait till the end of the year to claim all your CPEs and it's very easy to claim these. So I highly recommend that you take advantage of this for free and get those credits for your certifications. So really important. And uh, Satgit says, good to see you, sir. Good to see you as well. We also have Misty Eyed in the uh, chat. Great to have you as well. And I see some more people are hopping on. So that is always great to see. And uh, yeah, really enjoy doing these shows. Really enjoy having everybody hop on. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and take a minute to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Cyber Training Pro. And then after that, I'll see you on the other side and we'll go ahead and hop into the articles. So I'll see you in a second here. Are you tired of overpaying for cybersecurity training? Are you interested in training from industry professionals? Are you looking for cybersecurity career services? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then CyberTrainingPro.com is the perfect platform for you. At CyberTrainingPro, we're a one-stop shop for all your cybersecurity needs. We can train you for industry certifications or just improve your overall knowledge and skills in a certain area. Unlike other platforms, we don't stop there. We can also coach you throughout your career, practice your interview skills, or create a high-performing resume with our career services. CyberTrainingPro.com isn't just another training platform. Students get exclusive access to our private community where we go beyond training courses to provide additional content, tips and tricks, and engagement with both other students and staff. Look, by the year 2025, there could be as many as 3.5 million job openings in cybersecurity. With so much opportunity, why not maximize your career potential with a platform that cares about your success? Come join us at CyberTrainingPro.com and start building your future today. All right. Thanks to Cyber Training Pro for helping support the content that we make, helping support the show. We love our sponsors. You should love our sponsors too, because the sponsors make all of this possible and specifically they make it possible for free for you. So uh, we really value our sponsors. If you're a company and you're uh, just stumbling upon this show and you're interested in sponsoring content, whether on this show or just the channel in general, then definitely check out the description. There's more information there about how you can kick off that conversation and uh, and get some content sponsored. So again, we love having sponsors. We're really appreciative of the sponsors that help make this stuff possible. So 
With that being said, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna flip over to my screen and we're gonna hop into the first article here. So first article, open tofu denies HashiCorp's uh, code stealing accusations. HashiCorp did more than claim open tofu had misappropriated some of its code. And that's kind of the claim here. Its law firm, Wilson Sansi, issued a cease and desist order against open tofu. This read in part, and this is a quote, this is a cease and desist demand to the supporters of the Open Tofu project. Specifically, Open Tofu has repeatedly taken code from HashiCorp provided only under the business software license, the BSL, and used, in it, in a, uh, used it in a manner that violates those license terms and HashiCorp's intellectual property rights. In at least some instances, Open Tofu has incorrectly relabeled HashiCorp's code to make it appear as if it was made available by HashiCorp originally under a different license. This also says Open Tofu replied, so they replied to this. They said the Open Tofu team vehemently, uh, vehemently <laughs> disagrees with any suggestion that it misappropriated, missourced, or otherwise misused HashiCorp's BSL code. All such statements have zero basis in facts. In addition, it said HashiCorp claims of copyright infringement are completely unsubstantiated. So think about this just in a general context, right? Like not even in this specific situation. One of the things that you'll see if you work in tech or if you work in cybersecurity, whether that is currently or in the future, right? Doesn't matter which one. But as you do that, one of the things that happens sometimes is you will use things like open source software or other code libraries or things like that, right? Basically other things that in certain circumstances you can reuse. Now, open source is one in particular that's very interesting because it's kind of similar to this, right? Because what happens is these companies that make this stuff available for you to use, they have these specific licenses or agreements that go along with that, right? So you can use the code or reuse the code in this situation, but not in this situation, those kinds of things, right? So what happens as a, typically as a company, right? As an individual, it's probably not gonna affect you. But as a company, one of the things that can happen is you have to follow those terms, first of all, but if you don't, then they can certainly take legal action, even if that code is free to use, right? So sometimes we see that with open source software, or open source code, is that as a company, you reuse it, but what happens to that? Well, if that license says that if you use this commercially or for business uses, you have to pay us X amount of dollars, right? Or we own whatever you've created with that, or we own a portion of what you've ever, what you've created with that, right? These are all legitimate things that happen, right? Like this is realistic stuff. This is not just an individual kind of outlier case that happens. You have to be concerned with this stuff and you have to look at that. And as a developer, right, like an individual developer, you might not be all that concerned about it. Or if you have individual developers in your company, right, like single employees, they might not care about it. But that can create significant issues for you, especially if it's, you know, a massive project or really important project and all of a sudden you find yourself in the situation that's a bad, that's a bad day, right? Like that's not good. So let's keep reading here. As for the code in question, open tofu claims it can, can clearly be shown to have been copied from older code under the Mozilla public license, MPL 2.0. HashiCorp seems to have copied the same code itself when they implemented their version of this feature. All of this is easily visible in our detailed SEO analysis, as well as their own comments. So they are saying, you know, obviously that they took this code from a different license or under a different context, and they're kind of shuffling things around, right? Misleading or misusing it as it is supposed to be used. This Open Tofu's attorney said, and this is a quote, both the Open Tofu files to which you refer and HashiCorp's uh, Terraform files to which you compare them are both derived at least to some degree from the pre-fork MPL 2.0 files code that was made publicly available under the MPL, which is you know, just a general license, 
Therefore, to my client's knowledge, none of the Terraform code subject to the business license, the BUSL, has been improperly copied, incorrectly sourced, or used for any purpose. So you start to get this dispute because some of these situations can be interesting <laughs> or confusing, right? Depending on how the licenses are written out and how all this stuff is, uh, you know, basically laid out. But, you know, it, again, it's a serious issue that can cause a lot of heartache for your company or for your team. So I encourage you to be very careful with your supply chain, with how you ingest software, where you source software from, that vetting process that allows you to reuse code and do those things, right? How, how does that approval process work? Is there any approval process? It's a serious issue. It may not sound like it without having heard this article even, but it, it can cause so many issues. Think if you created Twitter, right? And all of a sudden you have open source software in there where they can claim rights to it. That's crazy, right? Like that is, ah, that, that can be bad, right? So be very, very careful. Next article, bat, uh, bat, bat, bad, but flaw. <laughs> what a weird name. Allowed an attacker to perform command injection on Windows. Critical vulnerability named bat, bad, but impacts multiple programming languages, its, ex its exploitation can lead to command injection in Windows applications. This is a quote, the, uh, the vulnerability that, I'm not gonna keep saying that, <laughs> that is difficult to say, right? Again, work on these names. Whoever's naming all of this stuff, these uh, ransomware gangs and everything like that, try to pick a little bit more catchy name, right? Uh, is a vulnerability that allows an attacker to perform a command injection on Windows applications, that indirectly depends on the create process function when the specific conditions are satisfied. Wrote the researcher, create process, so the, the function, implicitly spawns uh, cmd.exe, which is the command prompt in Windows, when executing batch files, so .bat extensions, .command extensions, and so on, even if the application didn't specify them in the command line. Due to the Windows default inclusion of uh, bat extensions and command extension files in the path text environment variable some runtimes inadvertently execute batch files instead of the intended commands this can lead to arbitrary command in executions even if a snippet like the following one doesn't ex uh, explicitly exclude dot bat or dot command files and you can see the screenshot on the screen here or if you check out the article but it, basically it's just a very simple um, just a very simple script here uh, so the conditions that have to be satisfied to actually exploit this include the application executes a command on Windows. So it can't be a Mac computer. <laughs> the application doesn't specify the file extension of the command or the extension is .bat or .cmd. So again, batch files or uh, command files. The command being executed contains user controlled input as part of the command arguments. So a user has to provide input like we saw in the earlier script here. And then the runtime of the programming language fails to escape the command arguments for command.exe properly. The CERT CC from Carnegie Mellon University published an advisory on this issue. Four different CVE identifiers, respectively CVE 2024-1874, CVE 2024-22423, CVE 2024-24576 and CVE 2024-3566 have been assigned to this issue. So this is just one of those things where, you know, it, it stinks when there's these kind of vulnerabilities that exist and sometimes you can't necessarily do a lot about them, but it is important to understand, you know, that they exist. If there are solutions, how you can fix those or especially with code, right? When you're going through code and you're doing reviews, looking for things like known vulnerabilities, right? Like common things. That's why one of the things that you have to do is you have to have your developers trained on security best practices, at least what's relevant to their job, right? That's kind of the standard user education is at least what is standard to a person's job. That's like the minimum that they should get. 
if you start stacking on or adding on a bunch of other security training that's not really relevant, it's not really that effective or helpful. And a lot of times it's just burning money, right? Like it's just wasting because they don't need the extra security. Like if it's a developer and they're specifically developing like iOS applications, why would you send them to like a Windows Server security boot camp or something, right? Like it's just doesn't make sense. So users have to be educated, right? That is a core fundamental of any good security program, any compliance requirement. So if you have any certifications from uh, industry certifications, ISO 27001 or you know any of those, SOC 2, HIPAA, all that stuff, it requires that users are provided security awareness training. So again, it needs to be relevant to what they're doing though. Next article here, Telegram fixes Windows app zero day used to launch Python scripts. Over the past few days, rumors have been circulating on X, so formerly Twitter, and hacking forms about an alleged uh, remote, uh, remote ex code execution vulnerability in Telegram for Windows. While some of these posts claimed it was a zero-click flaw, the, video demonst the videos demonstrating the alleged security warning bypass and RCE, so remote code execution vulnerability, clearly show someone clicking on a shared media to launch the Windows calculator. Telegram quickly disputed these claims, stating they can't confirm that such a vulnerability exists and that the video is likely a hoax. And then there's a picture of their Twitter uh, post here as well, or X post, I guess, rather, right? Uh, however, the next day, a proof of concept exploit was shared on the, uh, the cross-site scripting, so XSS hacking form, explaining that a typo in the source code for Telegram for Windows could be exploited to send python.pyzw files, that's the uh, extension, that bypass security warnings when clicked. This caused the file to automatically be executed by Python without a warning from Telegram like it does for other executables and was supposed to do this for, uh, do, was supposed to do for this file if it wasn't for a typo. To make matters worse, the proof of the concept exploit disguised the Python file as a shared video along with a thumbnail that could be used to trick users into clicking on the fake video to watch it. So again, with this, and make sure to check out the article if you're using Telegram, if you have users that are, but a lot of this comes down to user education, right? Like as an organization, and uh, Satgit says this, ter uh, is it supposed to be ter terrible vulnerability, uh, vulnerable? Terrible, vulnerable, vulnerable. Um, yeah, I mean, it, if you're dealing with Telegram and you have users that use Telegram, you know, your company uses Telegram, whatever, user education, right? Like this is a kind of a follow on to that last, last article, really, because Telegram itself, if the application has a vulnerability in it and there's no new patch, right? You don't have a new version of the software that you can download and install then what do you do, right? Like you as a consumer of an application, right? As your company, because you just use the application like Microsoft Windows, right? Like you use Microsoft Windows, you can't create a new version of Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Office or anything like that, right? Like you're just not gonna do it. So if it is literally in the code base of the application or software or whatever service, what do you do, right? Starts with user education. Try to lock it down as much as possible. Try to do those core things, right? Those fundamental security tasks or security requirements, so uh, the security controls. And then you kind of just have to make a decision, right? Like it's all risk based, right? If the risk is substantial enough, does it make sense to continue with that vendor or with that service or application? Or does it make sense to go with something else? to change the business process, to, you know, what do we want to do, basically? And that is risk management 101 for sure, right? Like that all ties back to that, ties back to what you have documented within your risk register and how you've assessed that risk and what you over, uh, what your thoughts are overall based on your risk appetite and like all these things. But what do you want to do, right? What are the pros and cons of each decision? And does it make sense to go one way versus the other, right? It's always going to make sense to go one way, right? Like you're going to make some decision. You might accept that risk and just keep going as is. Hopefully there's a new patch. You might get insurance. I mean, with Telegram, you're probably not going to get insurance as a company for Telegram, 
but uh, maybe as actually the Telegram company, right? But it's it's one of those things where it can be a challenge, right? Especially if you have a non-responsive vendor, but you need that software, or if you know it's just something that is not uh, substantial enough for them to fix, or whatever the case is, right? Like it could be a challenge for sure. Tag it says I delete it from your uh, desktop. Yeah, I mean that's certainly a choice you can make, right? And especially on you know end user applications or software. Sometimes, you know, you don't go through that full risk management process, right? It's not as common, but totally in a business, you're definitely going to go through that. Next article here, Firebird rat creator and seller arrested in the U.S. and Australia. Joint police operation between the Australian Federal Police, the AFP, and the FBI has led to the arrest charging of two individuals who are believed to be behind the development and distribution of the Firebird remote access Trojan, so the rat, later rebranded as Hive. Firebird used to have a dedicated site that promoted it as a remote administration tool. However, the homepage features such as stealthy access, password recovery from multiple browsers, and elevation of privileges through exploits, which uh, communicate the intended message to prospective buyers. The Australian Federal Police, AFP, Alleged, alleges that the, Australian, uh, that the Australian developed and sold the rat on a dedicated hacking form, enabling other users who paid for the tool to remotely access victims' computers and perform unauthorized activity. Pretty standard stuff with rats, right? The Australian man faces 12 charges, including for the production, control, and supply of data intended to commit computer offenses. So that's kind of one thing that we're seeing, even in the U.S., right? Is we're still trying to figure out how to charge people with these kinds of crimes, like hacking and things like that, right? The um, wire fraud uh, was a big way that has been used, especially in like the United States, to go after people. And sometimes, especially kind of as things are evolving, it's not always like applicable, right? Like we have to modify laws, we have to put new laws in place, get rid of old laws or restructure them, do all these kinds of things to make sure that, you know, there's something to go after them, right? Because if nothing says essentially that you can't create rats or can't hack somebody's system, what are they going to charge you with, right? Like they could just do it. So it is interesting always to see these uh, joint country investigations or joint country arrests, right? We do see them relatively often, I would say. And sometimes, you know, people will be arrested in other countries and they'll be ex, uh, extradited to whichever country is kind of taking the lead or going after them. We'll also see them charged locally, right? Like in this article, we don't see them uh, extraditing this person to like the United States, right? We see them being charged and everything by Australian federal police. So it's always interesting to watch these, though. And look at this, too. Facing a maximum penalty of 36 years of imprisonment. That's a lot of years. <laughs> that is a lot of years. No! That's probably what you would be saying if you were facing 36 years. But uh, I think everybody else that uh, got affected by that is probably like... <laughs> yeah, probably pretty happy if somebody created some malware like that or a rat like that that is causing havoc. In a separate case, a buyer clearly told the seller his goals were to steal $20,000 worth of Bitcoin and $5,000 worth of documents, leaving no doubt about the intention to use the tool for illegal activities. So he said it clear as day, right? Like it's very clear what he's going to do. The defendant has pled not, uh, pleaded not guilty to the charges facing multiple counts of conspiracy to advertise a device Uh, a device as an interception tool, transmit code that causes damage to protected computers and intentionally unauthorized access to data. So yeah, again, it's, it's always interesting when they go after some of these bad guys and we're starting to see them get really good at identifying who's doing this stuff and tracking them down, which is just amazing, right? Think about like 30 years ago, like they're, they got to track people down by like phone calls and stuff like that. It's like, how are you going to do that 
when people are making phone calls on like pay phones because you know 30 years ago but <laughs> but now it's you know internet and uh ip addresses and all that stuff and they're just pinpointing people so if you're thinking about doing bad things it they're getting really sophisticated and good at tracking people down. So good luck. And Sadget says, unfortunately, business laptop and has evidence on it. Or uh, I'm guessing an incident. And hello from Pakistan. Hello. Hello from the United States. All right, let's keep moving here. Ex-security engineer jailed three years for $12.3 million crypto exchange thefts. A former security engineer has been sentenced to three years in prison in the U.S. for charges relating to hacking two decentralized cryptocurrency exchanges in July 2022 and stealing over $12.3 million. No! Shakib Ahmad, the defendant in question, pled guilty to one count of computer fraud in December 2023 following, uh, following his arrest in July. This is a quote. At the time of both attacks, Ahmad, a U.S. citizen, was a senior security engineer for an international technology company whose resume reflected skills in, among other things, reverse engineering smart contracts and blockchain audits, which are some of the specialized skills Ahmad used to execute the hacks. The, Department, the U.S. Department of Justice, DOJ, noted at the time. Court documents show that Ahmad exploited a security flaw in an unnamed cryptocurrency exchange, smart, uh, exchanges smart contracts, to insert fake pricing data to fraudulently generate millions of dollars worth of inflated fees, which he was able to withdraw. This is another quote. Ahmad used an exploit he discovered in Nirvana's smart contracts to allow him to purchase cryptocurrency from Nirvana at a lower price than the contract was designed to allow, the DOJ said. So this is kind of an insider 101 case, right? We see this definitely at companies around the world, right? Since it's cryptocurrency, right? Let's think of like financial industries, banks, things like that. And there are a ton of restrictions if we're looking at companies like banks, right? Because banks have been around forever. Banks, banking is very structured as far as how things work. Obviously, like in the United States, we've have, had some pretty catastrophic events with banks and loans and things like that and how all that works with leverage and you know all that kind of stuff. So we're not going to really talk about that specifically. But there's a lot of controls that are in place, right, for those kinds of companies. With cryptocurrency being relatively new, right? Like it's not like it came out this year, but it's still relatively new in the grand scheme of things. It still really isn't uh, very standardized, at least nowhere near the level of something like a bank, right? Something like a Wells Fargo or JP Morgan or something like that. So there's still all these kind of questions and concerns with cryptocurrency, how it works. How stable is it? You know, what is the security of the block of the uh, the exchanges and things like that, and the actual cryptocurrency itself? And you know, so there, there's a ton of questions, right? But as a company, how are you preventing insiders from committing fraud, for example? Right? If you've ever studied for things like the Security Plus or Security Certification (CISSP), something like that then you've definitely talked about things like least privilege, separation of duties, right? Like those are pretty common things that we talk about all the time in cybersecurity. And so this is kind of one of those things where, you know, what controls you have in place to prevent insider threats from realizing or executing whatever their plan is, right? Remember, employees are trusted people, right? They're trusted insiders, and so they have legitimate access to something, depending on how your organization works. If you haven't been reducing or removing old privileges, maybe there's some privilege creep and somebody who started with the company very early has got a lot of privileges. If you make that person mad, right, they might do some bad stuff. They, they know the inner workings of how things work and certainly that is a lot more dangerous 
than somebody that is on the outside that doesn't have a legitimate account. They don't have you know, legitimate reason to be on internal systems or anything like that. They don't know a lot about the inner workings of how things work in your company or in your cryptocurrency exchange, right? So it's a, it's a difference in how things are set up in the amount of risk that is associated to that, what kind of controls actually need to be implemented and how those controls should be implemented for the most effective results, right? So it's, it's a whole discussion there. Insider threat is one of those areas where there are more and more jobs focused on that every day, right? There's a lot of jobs in cybersecurity that are, you know, obviously emerging and growing, but insider threat is definitely a very important one that you do see jobs starting to pop up for people that specialize in that kind of skill set or that kind of role. And certainly that can be very interesting if that is appealing to you, right? You want to do investigations or try to think outside the box of how people would go about uh, kind of bypassing different controls and doing bad things, right? It's fascinating, frankly, <laughs> but um, definitely be on the lookout for that if that interests you and check out this article too. Linux Gamer says, where's the dough? Yeah, I, I, have, that, I have that on the list. I will, <laughs> I promise I will, uh, I am looking at that. 8-Bit Oni says, hi, hey, how's it going? Insider Threats does not have to be malicious. It can also be due to accidents. Yeah, certainly. I mean, insider threats, there, there's multiple uh, aspects to that, right? People can unintentionally do things. They can click links. They can you know, do all these things, right? This thing in particular, I mean, obviously this article is more slanted towards the malicious side of things. And that's kind of why, you know, with this article, that's what the way I've been talking, but you're absolutely correct that uh, it doesn't have to be malicious. It can totally be accidental and unintentional, right? But that's why you put these controls in place. That's why you limit privileges. That's why you uh, have least privilege. You have separation of duties, right? You have all these checks in place. So even uh, accidental things don't, uh, don't have as high a probability of happening, right? You have to put two-factor authentication in or you have the first approval step of something and then it goes on to somebody else, right? That's more steps in there that can catch either accidental things or intentional things, right? Absolutely, great point. Uh, let's see, Jeffrey Christian says, Downla downloading Shadow IT. Another great example, right? With insiders, they can download malware, they can download, um, you know, they can do all kinds of things, right? Like there's so many different scenarios that can apply to this that it is, uh, it's scary if you start thinking about it. So I wouldn't spend too much time on it because you'll probably be very uh, pessimistic and, you know, yeah, it's a very negative, uh, negative context a lot of times with insider threats because we spend a lot of time talking about the intentional things for sure because, you know, just how it is, right? Insider threats. There are threats to the organization. Ape Oni says people are always focused on in, uh, insider threats. Yep. Uh, ignoring some of the mo more innocent ones or the ones that might not be thought about. Yeah. I mean, just kind of how we, we approach it because a lot of the, you know, when we're thinking about insider threats, even though that is true, right? There's multiple sides to it. Typically, we think more about the insider threat that is like accidental and things like that. We think of that in the context of like good security hygiene and putting in uh, standard controls and, you know, those kind of security measures. So we think about it as far as uh, remediating, remediating it in that context, even though we don't typically mention the word a lot of times as far as insider threat connected to that, even though like you're absolutely right. Like in the general sense and how we define it, it technically is. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Ben Oni says weakest part of security are the people. That is, uh, yeah. <laughs> true words, true words. Jeffrey says cybersecurity awareness training. Absolutely. Cybersecurity awareness training. That's the answer to everything, right? 
cybersecurity awareness training. <laughs> Sometimes just a simple auditing, 8 Oni. Yep, absolutely. That's why you have to do a lot of these things, these good security hygiene practices to make sure that you're secure, right? Next article here, Roku says 576,000 accounts compromised in latest security breach. About 576,000 Roku accounts were compromised in a recent cyber attack with hackers making unauthorized purchases on some accounts. The company announced Friday the latest cybersecurity incident involving the company after thousands of accounts were compromised last month. Yeah. No! Oh, Roku. Roku uncovered the breach as it investigated last month's incident, which affected more than 15,000 accounts, the company announced. In less than 400 cases, Roku said malicious actors, and that's in quotes, logged in and made unauthorized purchases for streaming subscriptions and Roku hardware products, though the company said it would refund those purchases. Well, that's nice. Those credentials were stolen through credential stuffing, cyber attack in which uh, hackers used stolen names and passwords from another platform to log into other platforms, the company said. Credential stuffing is a pretty common attack, so definitely be familiar with that if you work in cybersecurity. Uh, Roku said the passwords for all affected accounts have been reset and customers have been notified about the breach while two-factor authentication has been turned on for all accounts, including those not impacted by breaches to improve security. So this is still one thing that is so interesting to me right? Like you see companies and vendors that are still providing services, applications, things like that, but they are not requiring people to set up multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication. Yet we have companies like GitHub and apparently now Roku who are flipping that switch and requiring users to do that now. So it's interesting how we kind of have this disconnect where some are forcing, enforcing it or requiring it, some are not, right? Some companies require it and some don't. By the way, make sure to get your Cyber Threat Intel merch if you haven't picked it up. We have mugs, shirts, all kinds of stuff, right? There's a link in the description if you're interested in getting that. So really nice designs, right? Like there's some other designs too other than Cyber Threat Intel, but I really like these Cyber Threat Intel uh, designs. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing here to really point out, though, too, is and I've said it before. It's like once you have a cyber attack, a cyber incident, you're going to get tested again, right? The first one especially is not always the largest, right? The first one could just be like a test. You know, can we access a thousand accounts? Oh, we can. OK, we're not going to change anything in those a thousand accounts. We're going to we're going to access a half a million accounts because we know we can and then we're gonna change things on mass scale, right? Or do things on mass scale. Very common, right? Even when we talked about ransomware, right? One of the things that I said was, if you get compromised by ransomware, you're going to get tested again, right? That's not the first time. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the last time that you'll get tested rather, right? We've seen that happen quite a bit, and that is always the case. So you should always be ready for the second uh, situation, the second attack. And that's why you need to do things to resolve or root cause analysis to identify what the problem was and fix that problem, right? Address it, put in controls, uh, implement controls, do something, change your business process, change your software. I don't know, update your software, something, right? Let's see here. All right, let's go to this next article here. House passes reauthorization of key U.S. surveillance program after days of upheaval over changes. The House voted Friday, and this is the House in the United States, to reauthorize and reform a key U.S. government surveillance tool following a dramatic showdown on the floor over whether the FBI should be restricted from using the program to search for Americans' data. The legislation approved Friday would extend the surveillance program for two years rather than the full five-year authorization first proposed. Johnson hoped that the shorter timeline would sway GOP critics by pushing any future debate on the issue to the presidency of Donald Trump if he were to win back the White House in November. 
Still, the legislation teetered precariously Friday morning as lawmakers voted on an amendment uh, vociferously, (laughs) another awesome word, opposed by Johnson, the White House, and sponsors of the legislation that would have prohibited the warrantless surveillance of Americans. Legislation approved Friday would permit the U.S. government to collect without a warrant communications of non-Americans located outside the country to gather foreign intelligence. Reauthorization is currently tied to a series of reforms aimed at satisfying critics who complained of civil liberties uh, violations against Americans. In the past year, U.S. officials have revealed a series of abuses and mistakes by FBI analysts in improperly querying the intelligence repository for information information about Americans or others in the U.S., including about a member of Congress and participants in the racial justice protests of 2020 and the January 6, 2021 riot at the U.S. Capitol. Violations have led to demands for the FBI to have a warrant before conducting database queries on Americans, which FBI Director Chris Wray has warned would effectively gut the program's effectiveness and would also be legally unnecessary given the information in the database has already been lawfully collected. So there are all kinds of controversies around spying and basically being able to collect intelligence on people and identifying information and all this stuff, right? We have seen so many issues and just regulations and things brought up and it's always this debate, right? We always see the tools talked about. We see other countries that are talking about how they are spying on people, but in other instances, it might be referred to as collecting intelligence, right? You, do, you, you can make up the decision for yourself, right? You can make up your mind for yourself as far as which one you think it is. But we do see that, right? We see this constant back and forth as far as, you know, especially in the United States, one of the concerns is that there has been concerns and controversy controversy around incidentally, supposedly, right? Like accidentally collecting information on, uh, on U.S. citizens, right? Which in the United States generally is a big no-no, right? That's something that we frown upon. But it just keeps coming back up in the news, right? Even when we talk about Pegasus, right? Some people get really spun up about Pegasus, which is a common spying tool but it's only sold to governments. So this will be interesting to kind of see how this plays out. Again, you know, this is not going away, right? We're going to keep talking over time about all the surveillance stuff because it's a real, uh, real concern from a privacy aspect, right? Especially in the United States, as we are getting more privacy regulations and things that are being implemented, how does all this stuff kind of start to mesh together, right? Like this is kind of, the old style, right? The old school as far as collection of data and very laxed privacy regulations. But we're moving towards a more privacy privacy regulated environment. So how is that going to affect things if we start having changes as far as government representation and those laws that are enacted and what is allowed, what is not? You know, this stuff is going to collide and it's going to be interesting to kind of see, right? <laughs> Jeffrey Christian says, Christian says, Pegasus is back, facepalm. Yeah, I told you. Pegasus seems to come up all the time, right? Like, it, it's just everywhere. There's always articles that are related to it in some way or that are about it or, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Christensen says, where is Snowden when you need him? I think he's still in Russia, right? Like, I think that was the last thing that I saw. I'm not tracking him, but, um, I think that was the last place that I had heard. So, uh, MW says, Hey, uh, thanks for the broadcast. Hey, you bet. Absolutely. Jeffrey Christensen says 1984. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean. It's, it's always an interesting discussion, right? Like there, again, it's not going to be the last time that we talk about the surveillance stuff, especially 
again, as more privacy regulations come into play, we start changing representation in the government. Uh, you know, government gets more sophisticated as far as like the laws that are in place or the things that they're doing. You know, it's it's not going away, right? Like as we use more and more technology, we're just putting more and more data out there. And then it's about how can that data be collected? How can it be used? You know, all of those concerns, all of those issues. So yeah, it, it will definitely be something that we have to continue to watch into the future for sure. Eternal Blue version 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. With that being said, that is the last article for this episode. Again, this is Cyber Threat Intel, episode number 17. It is Monday, April 15th, 2024. I'm your host, John Good, and it's been a pleasure delivering the information to you. Depending on where you're watching or where you're listening, remember that we are available on a video on-demand format. We also do the live stream of this show. So when we actually record it and put it out there, it's the live stream on the John Good Cyber YouTube channel, John Good Cyber on LinkedIn, John Good Cyber on Twitter or X, John Good Cyber the page on Facebook. So John Good Cyber page on Facebook. You can also go to your favorite podcast platform and search for us on there. Again, Cyber Threat Intel will come up on there. Or you can go to cyberthreatintel.com, again, cyberthreatintel.com, and you can find all the platforms that we're on on there. You can also find the article feed. So if you want to see the articles we covered today, or if you want to look at the articles from other episodes, or we put a bunch of other articles on there as well. So there's a whole bunch of information, easy for you to access and track everything that you need to in one convenient location, right? That's why we do it. So make sure to also get your merch, right? Cyber Threat Intel merch, always good stuff. And we appreciate uh, the support for that as well. We appreciate everybody that hopped on here. It's great to have you on a Monday. I know Mondays are a struggle because you're just getting out of the weekend, but it's important, right? Got to stay on top of it. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. I want to thank you for joining and I'll see you in the next one. See you later. Are you tired of overpaying for cybersecurity training? Are you interested in training from industry professionals? Are you looking for cybersecurity career services? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then CyberTrainingPro.com is the perfect platform for you. At CyberTrainingPro, we're a one-stop shop for all your cybersecurity needs. We can train you for industry certifications or just improve your overall knowledge and skills in a certain area. Unlike other platforms, we don't stop there. We can also coach you throughout your career, practice your interview skills, or create a high-performing resume with our career services. CyberTrainingPro.com isn't just another training platform. Students get exclusive access to our private community where we go beyond training courses to provide additional content, tips and tricks, and engagement with both other students and staff. Look, by the year 2025, there could be as many as 3.5 million job openings in cybersecurity. With so much opportunity, why not maximize your career potential with a platform that cares about your success? Come join us at cybertrainingpro.com and start building your future today.